Good afternoon and welcome to our webinar, How to Prepare Your Orthopedic Practice for the SEO Changes Coming in 2024. My name is Rachel Mew and I manage the corporate marketing for my advice and I will be moderating the event today. Our presenter today is Michael Antozzi, Senior Director of Practice, Practice Growth at My Advice. Michael is a national speaker and practice growth consultant with us. He has consulted with thousands of orthopedic practices since 2010, and his counsel and guidance have been transformative in making his clients' lives better by saving them time, earning more profit, and helping to make his practices more competitive in their markets. His passion is in helping his clients succeed. Some housekeeping tips just before we jump in. Um, we'll save all the questions for the end, but as you think of them, please submit them in the chat, the Q&A, and I'll monitor those um, and keep an eye on those, so we'll make sure to get to everything at the end. Um, and then I will be sending a copy of the recording later today, just in case you miss anything, you want to share with a coworker, anyone who couldn't be here, et cetera. Um, and I think that's it. But if you have any questions, just um, pop them in the chat there. Um, and now I'll turn it over to Michael. Okay, Rich. Thank you so much. Thanks for the warm introduction. Hi, hey, everybody. Um, so I'm really excited to present this webinar here today because you know, think about what you've known about digital marketing and really how to drive your strategy and how Google placates into that. Because guys, the game has changed. Um, there's a lot, a big cultural shift that's really happened um, really since about a year and a half ago. And that's really been the onslaught of AI. It's affecting a lot of things that we're doing and living how our, our everyday lives from the technology that we're utilizing to how it's enhancing just our overall well-being and, and how we interact. And, and it's been a big shift in tech right now. And Google is doing a lot in terms of adapting to this very, very rapidly changing environment. So for you to stay, if staying at, for, at, at the forefront of your digital marketing strategy is something that is important for you, this is a very, very uh, great conversation and great topic to have because it's very, very timely. You know, Google has a system and you've always heard, you know, Google makes a lot, you know, a lot of these changes, but every few years, Google rolls out with some big major updates to its platform. Uh, a few years ago, we had the Panda update and then uh, there was the medic update and these are really big shifts that tend to reshuffle the deck, but they don't happen all that frequently. We've actually seen three of these major updates on Google's platform within the last 12 months. So in terms of how your website's optimized for search, in terms of how you're ranking for search, a lot has changed. And so you really want to be uh, listening in very, very closely to some of the update information that we have found here. Um, because a lot of these updates have been very, very intense, and it's important that you're really staying at the forefront of really what's happening. So let's talk about what has happened here. And there's a key term that you want to understand, which is called Google's most recent update, which is what's called its helpful content update. Now, what the heck does this mean? Um, the helpful content essentially is about how is your website in terms of the information that is being housed on your site? adding value to the individual that is on your site. If you've been engaged with SEO or content strategies historically with your past digital marketing, you've always heard about this whole phraseology that uh, content is king, content is king. Google loves being able to really index and, and show good content. What's been happening, especially with the onset of artificial intelligence and AI though, has been really this opportunity to produce rapid content, well-scripted well content very, very quickly without much thought or really intention that goes behind that, okay? Um, you've heard about this idea of unique content and how Google looks at the uniqueness of content. So think about it from this perspective. I, if I wanted to, I could go to ChatGPT right now and I could give it ChatGPT a sampling of my writing and how I actually use my languaging and say to ChatGPT, study this analysis of how I write. And based on how I write, now I want you to write me a 1000 word article in a question and answer based format on say hip arthroscopy. And within a few seconds, ChatGPT can analyze how I write. It can take those inputs of what I'm looking for and be able to produce something that it reflects to be, you know, what I'm looking for. And we can call that quote unquote unique content, okay? Because it is, I mean, it, it, the content has never been produced before. It's taking a writing sample of mine and now it's being able to produce something that is, you know, frankly never is, has existed before. But what does that definition of unique content really mean? You know, what do we actually call unique content? So what this helpful content update that Google has really 
has in, has has integrated into its algorithm, and these updates are always now rolling out. Is about how can we really find more vested content? You know, for example, um, looking at topics more holistically, uh, talking about why, if I'm say coming to you for a hip arthroscopy, why is it that I want to come to your practice? And so it's taking a topic and really getting much more specific and much more granular in terms of that type of content that is on the website. So now is the time where you need to be adapting your content strategy for your website to really help to maintain good rankings. And the reason why rankings are so valuable and so important is because it helps to drive so much more visibility for your practice. There's actually a stat that we had found here that just by improving your website's search position just by one on Google, and just so you um, have some context, I live outside of Philadelphia. And so if I were to say, look for knee surgeon Philadelphia, and your website was ranking at say number seven for that position, and by having some good SEO strategies, you now bump up to number six. Just that one increase in your search position on average will drive 30% more traffic to your website. So everybody, this is why SEO strategies are so important and so critical because it's only helping to just maximize your practice's exposure of that site. So that way that site can do its, its, its the proper job of converting that traffic into leads and opportunities and consultations and surgeries and therefore revenue for your orthopedic practice. Big shift in terms of these content, these content updates is that the content is no longer just about keyword optimization. It's getting away from writing content for bots and spiders and writing it for people, okay? That's why we're talking about this helpful content update. How is your website's content reflecting in a common vernacular of say questions or types of things that your patients are always asking you about specific surgeries or procedures at your office? You know, this whole, game of, you know, if I was trying to say be number one for, again, hip arthroscopy in my local market in town, well, Dr. So-and-so does hip arthroscopy. Did you know that Dr. So-and-so has done hip arthroscopy for over 20 years, that he is an expert at doing hip arthroscopy? That's kind of an example of what we call keyword stuffing, okay? And back in the day, I mean, that was a very helpful strategy for your SEO because it was basically showing a search engine like Google that, hey, this is a topic that's about you know, hip arthroscopy. This doctor does a lot of hip, hip arthroscopy. You can verify that because the content on that page talks so much about hip arthroscopy. You can kind of see where I'm going here in terms of that keyword stuffing. And that's really no longer going to be looked at as being very relevant content anymore. It's about the biggest challenge is that how can we really drive content about a particular topic or service that's really answering questions that a lot of your patients are having about that particular topic. Now, additively as well too, everybody, what we've also found is that the old way of doing SEO in terms of your content strategies, you know, I would talk to doctors oftentimes where they would say, hey, I, I'm the knee guy or I'm the shoulder guy. And that's the one thing that I really want to be found for. Yes, I do a lot of other things within orthopedics, but like I really want to be doing a lot more hips or I want to be doing a lot more knees or shoulders, what have you. And so often content would really be strategized around, okay, let's maybe put some of those other services or surgeries to the wayside and let's really develop content strategies that are about this one particular thing that this provider wants to be promoting more of. That is now an SEO strategy that can really degrade a ton of traffic to your site where you're basically trying to cherry pick particular subjects and then really write content around them where you're also then ignoring other pieces of your website's content as well. Um, you know, a few years ago, uh, I had attended a, a lecture, a guy by the name of Matt Cutts, who um, ran Google's search, especially on the healthcare side. And he had said to uh, the group that I was at this lecture, at that he said that Google has a favorite website. Okay. And I'll actually ask you to think about that rhetorically as well, too. And I'll give you guys some hints is that it's not a shopping website. It's not a social media site either. The Google has a favorite website, and there's one particular website that regardless of whatever it is that you search, you will find that one website. And I would encourage you guys to think about this. Go to Google right now and type in a favorite band that you like listening to, type in a place that you like to go visit, and also type in to say any other random subject that you can think about. I'm going to give you a 99% confidence rate 
that somewhere on those first 10 slots within that Google search, you're going to find that same website, that one website that I'm referring to. And that website is Wikipedia. Google loves Wikipedia. Google sees Wikipedia as being a very authoritative website because what Wikipedia does is it looks at particular subjects and it covers those topics very, very holistically. If you were to say go, do a Google search for say Dolly Parton or Metallica, you're gonna read, you're gonna find that subjects, subjects Wikipedia page and read a ton of information about you know, where Dolly Parton grew up or where Metallica got their first gig at or their history or their discography. And they talk about a subject matter in a very, very, very robust way. And Google likes to promote websites like that because they provide good value, good information. So the way that you really need to see your orthopedic website is being the, like the Wikipedia of orthopedic surgeries in your local town or your local community. Can you take a look at everything that you're doing and cover those topics in basically content formats of common questions that your patients are asking you and really add value to those people in covering those topics in very holistic ways. It's not just about the thing that you're trying to promote more of, but those other things that might not be as heavy revenue drivers still need the proper attention if you wanna drive the, the best organic traffic to your website. So what can you do? How can you really prepare for a lot of this? Again, this helpful content update, this question and answer based update. So there's two acronyms that you really wanna be familiar with. One is called EAT, which we actually call E-E-A-T. And the second one is Y-M-Y-L. So let's talk about EAT and what that actually means. So what EAT stands for is having a website, looking at a website very holistically. And when Google is looking at your site, looking at really four main components, which is what we call your experience, your expertise, your authoritativeness, as well as the trustworthiness of the website. And I'll break down at what each and every one of these EAT factors are as it relates to how you really drive your strategy as we move on here. Are you in the medical business? Are you, do you have an orthopedic practice or are you in finance? Websites or industries that either affect your money or your life are those industries that are most important, most being impacted by this big update that Google is making with this helpful content update. So obviously that applies to healthcare practices as well. So let's break this down here and let's talk about the EAT and let's start by talking about experience, okay? What does experience mean when Google is looking at a website and trying to say, this is a good website for us to promote more of? So what it's looking at is specifically is at the author of a piece of content to assess how much expertise do they have. So for example, in this case, it's being utilized as a journalist who writes on a particular subject matter a lot, someone who's reviewing a product who used it, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I always tell all my practice owners that if I could just take out my iPhone and literally just press on the record button and follow you around for the full day, I would have all of the website's content that I would need. Because what I'm basically doing is I'm recording who the experience or the authority is, which is obviously the providers, the doctors, those that are in the room that are doing these surgeries, doing consults with patients time and time and time again. So again, you know, this is why when we're talking about the, the experience of the author, you know, are you scripting your own original content? Um, sure, it's fine to start off with, say, some stock content that a company might be able to provide you because that gets you going. But eventually, the goal is to get rid of that content to, in, to insert or to evolve more of your own unique mindset and worldview of how you look at particular sur surgeries or topics at your practice. As a matter of fact, when we actually work with some of our practice owners and we will say, listen, we want to really evolve this one page on say knee surgery or hip surgery. We'll say to you, listen, what are the most common questions that you're being asked? You know, again, going back to that question and answer based format, list out those questions. And what you can do is just basically record your voice, speak those questions, just like you're talking to a patient. What we do when we evolve these content strategies then is we will actually listen to that audio, transcribe all that data, and then input that onto the page of that website. The output that we have is fresh, original, unique content that literally is the doctor's or the provider's voice that is in a text-based format, because what it's doing is it's helping to satisfy this experience 
criteria that Google is really looking at from the content side of things. And so again, your authority very much matters when we talk about the evolution and driving more traffic to your site. Expertise, somewhat is similar to experience, but it's a very, very important for, again, your money or your life websites, which includes the author and the publishing organization of a piece of content as well too. So for example, um, are, as you as the, the, the author of this content, um, are you also a part of other organizations? You know, maybe you're a part of AANA or maybe you're a part of AAOS or whatever that might be. Are you also highlighting a lot of your credentialing um, in terms of your thought leadership onto that site as well too? Again, um, what, as we apply this to really SEO and content-based strategies as well too, what we're also looking for when we really identify or want to enhance a website's rankings is a practice which is what we call link building. Can we associate um, your, um, your experience or your expertise rather with other credible organizations or other credible websites that exist online that might be familiar to that topic as well too and build more relationships with your website's domain name that will help to promote more of your website within organic search. And so again, this expertise factor is very, very critical because it's highlighting your credentialing from the, the wealth of experience that you have, because again, this is what you're doing day in and day out. Authoritativeness. Now what we're looking at, or what Google is really wanting to see is more of the periphery that really helps to give the entity itself, the, either the practice or the doctor itself, much more um, trust or credentialing rather. We're actually now zooming out and not necessarily looking at say, the website or the author of that content or the uniqueness of that content, how helpful it might be, but other factors as well too. For example, do you have a web, do you, for example, manage what we call local listings for your practice? And we're going to talk a little bit more about what that is later. Or do you have good social media? Are you putting out content on a continual basis to your social channels within Facebook and Instagram? Um, do you have a great, <coughs> pardon me, great reviews that are written about your practice online? All these are really pieces that matter in terms of the authority because Google's gonna look at a, a website, judge how great that content is, but also look at offsite sources to be able to validate and trust that yes, this is a good practice to really show more people for, to increase higher rankings and obviously more traffic to your practice to convert more leads and therefore revenue. Finally is trustworthiness, okay? Now we're actually looking at beyond just the content, beyond the, the periphery authority of a practice, now we're actually looking at the, some of the structural elements of your website. You know, for example, is your website SSL encrypted? Is it secure? Um, oftentimes, especially for older sites, if, if your site has uh, been up and active for say over 10 years, I will tell you that that website is likely an unsecure site and Google does not like that. Um, most likely for a website that's also aged about 10 years, it might not be mobile responsive. What I mean by that is, does a website have the ability to contract and expand itself depending upon the device size that it might be launched upon? You know, today's age, you really have to build your website for the mobile experience first and the desktop experience secondly. So these are all factors in terms of the infrastructure of the website that Google is looking at to really promote uh, this trustworthiness factor. So what I will also say here, guys, is that when we have really been doing this in terms of our strategies, we've, in many respects, my advice has really been ahead of this eat curve because everything that Google is looking at from the uniqueness or the authority of the content to the authority and the periphery trust factors or just the actual in website's infrastructure as well too. We have been doing and driving our strategies like this for many, 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 many years, even before this helpful content update came about. So in many respects, my advice really has been ahead of a lot of these changes here. And we, when we work with our practices, the most important thing to do is to make sure that you're building a digital strategy within the right layers and in the right way that ultimately will put you into a position where you're not overextending or increasing more overhead on your marketing budget, ultimately to see a lower return on your investment. If you found yourself frustrated where, yes, I'm spending a lot of this marketing dollars and I'm seeing money go out, but I'm not necessarily seeing the return come in, oftentimes it's gonna to relate to two main things. Number one is that your strategy of how you're executing is done out of process. 
In other words, you might have a website, but you're doing a ton of paid ads online, but yet you have really poor reviews or you're poorly review rated practice. Well, guess what? It doesn't matter how much money you're spending on your ads. It ain't going to work unless you have a, at least your Google reviews really, really dialed in. Secondly, though, in terms of how we find failure points is that there's no collaboration. There's no participation in terms of evolving the web strategy. Oftentimes I hear from practice owners that are very frustrated with some of their results is, oh, I can never get in touch with my marketing company, or I, I feel like I have to tell them what to do as opposed to them telling me what to do. You know, in today's age, you have to have a partner in this space that's really going to be here to be your guiding light, to, to help you to navigate a lot of these waters, especially with this big helpful content update that Google has just made. And being in a collaborative partnership where you're being told what to do, people are trying to keep you ahead of the headwinds is very, very, very critical. The reason why we are called My Advice is because we serve as, as advisors and guides to our clients to help them navigate. So inherently, just even in the word of our company name, it really reflects a partnership and not a vendorship, which is a very, very big difference. Now, with that said, though, again, when we want to grow out a strategy, we have developed a formula or a protocol, which is what we call our pyramid of success, that really teaches practice owners or administrators the right way of really constructing the web strategy. But it's very, very important that when you really want to grow online, you do all these things in sequence, because when the foundation is missing, it would be no different than me coming to any one of your doctors to say, hey, I, I need a knee surgery done, but I smoke and I drink and I party my face off all the time and I get really, really bad rest and I'm super overweight, but I'm expecting that I'm going to walk better because I've had you know, a knee replacement. Um, you would call that patient crazy. You would say, listen, if you, sure, we could do knee surgery on you, but if you really want to optimize your results, you gotta lose some weight first, right? So if that foundation is missing, Outcomes, positive outcomes are not going to be as fruitful because the, the, the right foundation isn't there. Your web strategy works no differently either. So let's dial these in here, guys, and let's talk a little bit more about how all these pieces fit in. First of all, starting with your website. You have to have a great website, and the reason why this is important is because the website is the hub that governs any type of visibility spoke that you do to give your practice more exposure. It doesn't even matter if you're doing reviews, if you're doing social media, if you have that billboard that's on I-95, or if you ran that TV ad or that radio ad, guess what? All those sources of trafficking, of visibility, lead back to your website. And that's where leads and conversions will happen, okay? So having a great website is very, very important. And first impressions are very much everything because if you don't have a good first impression of your practice's website, People are just going to leave to go to the next website that makes them feel better. You know, when's the last time that you have ever visited your website? Sometimes I talk to doctors and practice administrators. They'll tell me it's been years that they never go on it. And, you know, as, as much as this hurts to say, as well credentialed as your background is in terms of where you went to medical school, your training, all those hours of blood, sweat, and tears, and building out that 10,000-hour principle can be diminished in the blink of an eye just because somebody looks and perceives you online and says, well, this doesn't really impress me. The site might look old or the doctor might have poor ratings online. And they're choosing to go to the other practice that just might give them a better essence or a vibe. Um, you're talking to a guy right now that when I was living in California, I saw my dad through four orthopedic surgeries, him living in Pennsylvania. My dad is a blue collar guy. Um, not super, I love, love him in death, but he, when it came to, um, uh, making responsible orthopedic healthcare choices, he was about ready to have an 85-year-old orthopedic surgeon do spinal surgery on him. Okay, that's how much my dad was uh, not as well educated in the realm of what good healthcare would be. Um, I was helping to navigate my father through a lot of his healthcare choices just by first impressions doing my research online. So I can't tell you guys how critical that really is in terms of first impression, because if you're not just selling to the patient, Oftentimes, what you're having to do is also convince the people that are in that patient's ear to give that patient really the, the best guidance. So what does my website need in terms of going back to this trustworthiness factor? Again, because we're talking about this in yellow here below. Number one, a good user experience with fast load times. Having it be mobile friendly. Again, is it responsive to any device that it might be launched upon? Good content on every single page of your site. So in other words, what that means is if you're doing... Uh, various services within knee surgery or hip surgery or so shoulder surgery, 
not only do you need dedicated pages for each and every one of those topics, but even if there's subtopics beneath those, those subtopics need their own individual page. And so again, we're taking that Wikipedia example and looking at a particular subject and covering that very, very holistically. Having a good about us page, this is where a lot of, again, your experience and expertise comes into play. You know, where your background, where you've gone to medical school, even guys having a photo of the provider. Sometimes you'd be amazed at how many times I look at websites and the photo of the doctor is not even on there. It's like, well, if we're, if we're utilizing this to develop a relationship with the patient, would the patient at least not want to know what their provider looks like? Of course that they would. Um, a full description of who the authors are and who makes up your organization. Again, if you're uh, a group practice, which many orthopedic practices are, are you talking about each and every one of your providers having the, them have their own dedicated page as well too, and talking about their experience and their background and their expertise. And again, the, the focus always needs to be on quantity as opposed to uh, quality versus quantity. It's not just about putting as many irons out there and hoping something that sticks, but it's about the quality of that content. Again, developing content, not for bots and spiders, but for the people itself. As a matter of fact, we actually did a very big data case study and we've had profiled over 500 patients because we have a lot of data resources here with my advice. And if anyone is interested, I'm happy to uh, shoot you over a white paper that really kind of looks at what are patients seeking at in their healthcare providers. But in terms of how a website helps to establish trust, this is what patients want to see. Easy outreach, over 60, almost 60% 60 of our respondents indicated just an easy way to call the practice, uh, be able to make an appointment, Talked about, again, pictures of, of, of staff, um, you know, providers and, and staff members. Having a website that looks clean in terms of its design, nothing, nothing that's super salesy or stuffy. Um, you know, ironically enough, on the website side, people cited that testimonials were somewhat less important. Blog posts were a little bit less important. Now, I would say with blog posts, while patients don't necessarily go to them, they are very, very critical for your SEO strategy. So there's actually an inverse of this in terms of the SEO importance with blog content. Local listings. Let's talk a little bit more about what that means. By the way, everybody, if you have any questions on whatever we're talking about here, you're, you're going to see on a few of these entry slides here as we go to um, all of these frameworks of our pyramid. There's a little QR code that's here in your lower, lower left-hand corner of the screen. I would encourage you, um, if you have, and you'll have a few uh, additional opportunities to, uh, to scan this as well, but if you have any questions on what we're talking about here, I would encourage you, take out your phone, scan this, um, this integrates directly with my calendar. We can schedule a complimentary consultation, really kind of dive into some of the questions that you might have and uh, go from there. But local listings, let's talk a little bit more about what this is, why it's important. So I'm going to ask you to think about a question here and um, somewhat rhetorically here. If I were to say move to, uh, I, <coughs> I mentioned I live outside of Philadelphia. If I were to move to your town or a community, uh, maybe say I'm seeking somebody that does Tommy John surgery, or if I know I need um, hand surgery, or you know I need to get a knee replacement, whatever that might be. If I know that that's a thing that I want, but I just don't know who offers it, where is it that I go to start my journey of discovery? And you might say, maybe I might look at my insurance website, whatever that might be. But if you're also thinking about Google, you're 100% correct. Because talking about investing into cash-based services, or I know I need a specific thing, that's what Google is all about. Now, within the Google infrastructure, half of all Google searches are localized in some capacity. So what that means is that it coincides with a geographic location. I'm going to search for something, something, something using your town or your city or a more common vernacular of how patients search. And I'm probably even sure that if you're watching this webinar, you do this yourself as well, too, is you use that phraseology near me. So again, that could be knee surgery near me. That could be hip arthroscopy near me, whatever. So the question really is, is that what is Google looking at or in within a business entity say, to say, yes, you know what, patient, this is a great resource for you to take a look at. Does Google start by looking at the website itself? It will, but it's not the first thing that it's looking at. It's also not looking at your social media. But the very first thing that Google wants to see is what we call the consistency and the accuracy of your local listing data. So what does this mean? Local listings, um, you're also, you'll also hear these referred to as local citations. There are over 60 different what we call local profiles. 
as well as 15 applications. And I'm actually going to share with you guys a live example here for an orthopedic practice that I'm talking to. And these local profiles, you can kind of think about them as being like micro search engines. There's 60 of them as well as 15 applications. And Google looks at every single one of these profiles to basically affirm who are you, where are you, what is it that you practice, and what is it that you do. And it wants to see the consistency of that data among these directories. Okay. Now, if there is a lot of inaccuracies or inconsistencies with your local listing data, it ultimately reduces the trust that Google sees in your practice, which lessens visibility. With less visibility equals less leads. Less leads equates to less revenue. All right. So this is Platinum Orthopedics here. I appreciate you guys being our guinea pig here. But what we're finding here is that there's just a ton of citation inaccuracy. Okay. We refer to this entity as Platinum Orthopedics, and they practice in Fountain Valley, California. However, with some of these profiles here, they're not finding an address. Some of these profiles are actually saying, well, no, the, the name of this practice is Adam Holleran. Or sometimes they're saying, well, no, the entity name we call this is Orange County Orthopedics Specialists. Or this one is, you can kind of see there's all these incongruencies with their localized business data. OK, so if you're part of a group practice, if you've moved office locations, if you have a, 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 a formal name on your tax documentation, but then you have a DBA name. All of these or if you have a tracking phone number, all of this is basically means of really messing up a lot of your local trust. And the reason why this is important is because Google looks at this to basically qualify and validate businesses on a localized level. So if there's a lot of inaccuracies with that data, again, it reduces the trust that Google sees in your practice, and that has a direct tie to revenue degradation. That's why, again, your marketing strategy is not working as efficiently as it should be, okay? So how do you really help to basically address this, okay? Because how Google looks at local ranking is a function of these three things coming together, which is what we refer to as relevance, distance, and prominence. That's what makes up your localized SEO. And the relevance and prominence pieces have everything to do with your local listings. Now, for you to try to log into every single one of these 60 different local directories to try to change that data, and most importantly, manage this data, because unfortunately, these errors that we see here oftentimes are permanent errors. And it's because of where this source of misinformation comes from, which is what we call data aggregators, which could be things like credit card files, government records, leasing agreements, what have you. So what we do is we help to really address this problem through a software application that we have that's called Local Power, okay? What Local Power basically is, it's an integration that connects into a practice's Google business profile. It's basically a combination of offense and defense. Whereas if there is any misinformation or bad data out there about a particular practice, that misinformation will be suppressed through an API, okay? But the second thing, the most important thing that it does is it pushes the clean and the accurate listing information about your practice to all of these 60 different local directories, 15 applications, and it keeps it that way. Now, the more consistent that you are with your business data, it has a direct tie of driving more local visibility, website traffic, and therefore lead generation from your strategy. One of the things with my advice that I will talk to you guys about is that we're very, very, very qualitative and quantitative with measuring data. Um, we always measure what matters. And so what I'm sharing with you here is a dashboard for one of our practices here, Summit Orthopedics. And we're looking at the last six months of data compared to the prior six months of data. And what we're finding here is that over the last six months, this particular practice has increased their Google search impressions by 57%. They've increased their total maps impressions almost by that same metric as well here too, about 57%. Um, when we look at their Google listing actions here, people that are calling into the practice, making um, direction requests to the practice or things of that nature, all those inbound calls to actions are up by about 76%, okay? And we're able to qualify and share this with our clients because we can actually show you how your practice is showing up among all these local directories. We can quantify and show you overview data in terms of how many calls did we receive? How many website traffics were, how much website traffic was being driven from our Google business profile? How many times did people actually get direction requests to where we're actually located? 
All of these are calls to actions which equate to revenue on the back end. Again, this is all about fortifying a lot of that local trust, what we call that local SEO factor, that relevance and distance. Now, when we talk about what the next thing that Google is then looking for in terms of um, how it qualifies local search, it's then about reviews online. Specifically, what I mean by that is what you are doing to drive Google reviews. Why do reviews matter? Because reviews are a part of your SEO, okay? We talked about the eat factor, expertise, experience, authority, local listings, review building. This is all about satisfying what Google wants to see with the authoritativeness, the periphery of a particular entity, okay? Google looks at what people are saying about your business and it factors that into your trustworthiness. Your responses also matter as well too. Oftentimes I see practices that have a five-star rating. They have thousands of reviews, okay? And the patient might not leave any type of feedback. They just have five stars and that's it. That's because the particular practice might be using some type of automated review generation tool. Well, sure, yes, it might generate the review, but is that really going to add the juice to your marketing strategy? And the answer to that is no. Generating more reviews means that you have the opportunity to respond uh, to, um, to the less perfect ones as well too, because again, you're responding, your engagement of reviews actually is an SEO signaling factor that Google looks at. Think about your practice volume for a second, because when we talk about what constitutes an effective review strategy, it's really four main things that come together, which is having a great rating, a good volume of reviews. Are you responding to reviews? But the most important part of that is review consistency. Are you always constantly feeding your Google profile with new information about how great you are? It's not an ego thing, but it's also about facilitating Google trust. I talked to you about my story, how I was living in Los Angeles and I saw my dad through four orthopedic surgeries. Not being able to be there in the room for him, what was I judging as his eldest son in terms of what efficacy and or quality care looked like? It was all about how well-rated a doctor was and how well-reviewed the doctor was. And once I told my dad about this, I said, dad, look at how great this doctor is, how, how, how well-rated he was compared to the other guy that you wanted to go to. He was more engaged. He was like, wow, look at this guy. He, look at how well-reviewed he is. And so again, as much as this, this, I hate to say this, medicine has become much more commoditized in that way. Again, going back to, doesn't matter how great your credentialing was or is or your training, if that's not translating into what people perceive as quality care, they're just not going to convert. A metric that you should be thinking about is how many patients are you seeing on a weekly basis? So is your practice, say, a 100 patient per week practice or a 200 patient per week practice? On average, what you should be driving in terms of new reviews is a 5 to 10% return rate of new reviews compared to how many people that you're seeing in that given week or that given month. A challenge that a lot of my practice owners have, though, is they say, Michael, I have so many happy people. I ask them to leave me reviews. They say that they're going to do it, but they ultimately don't do it. And the reason why they don't do it, it's not because they're not willing to, but it's really your job as a practice owner or administrator to make that job much easier for that patient. So we insert another tool in terms of our toolkit here, which is a tool that we have that's called Review Power, okay? <clears throat> and what this tool basically does is it allows practice owners or administrators front desk folks, whomever, an ability of sending out a mass text message to as many of your patients all at the same time. And can you email out review requests? You certainly can, but when you're texting out review requests, that conversion of that review is 80% higher than any other modality, which is why you always wanna be in a discipline of texting. What we then do is we click on next. We can select just a general template here that you can certainly customize this if you would like to. What we have found is that the best review sites that are going to drive your revenue are Google and Facebook. Google is very much going to help you with acquiring more new business, acquiring more new revenue. However, a good social media presence really does its job with patient retention, increasing what we call patient lifetime value. Both are very, very important. Both will massage revenue from different ends. So there, then, the next piece about this is just very simply typing the patient's name putting in their cell phone number. And here you can type in individuals if you wanted to, or you can just export a CSV file from say your EMR, your patient database, whatever that might be, and just drop that list right into here. 
and just within a few seconds, able to send out a mass text message to as many of your patients all at the same time. This helps to save you a ton of time because you're not having to send out individual texts and replicating that process time and time and time again. You're basically uploading a list and all 50 people, 25 people, whatever that might be, gets that same message. Now on the receiving end, the patient gets a text message just like this, okay? It's just to the patient's name. It's all about removing the friction, guys. It's about making that process as easy as possible for the patient to just do, take a call to action. So for example, can I then click on this link? It takes me to a landing page where here I'm going to see your logo, but then these are your practice integrations with Google and Facebook. And once I've clicked on that integration, if I'm signed in, literally it takes me right here to where I then leave that review. It makes that process very, very easy. It's a two-step process and very, very simplistic. And again, what our data has found is that the more that you are generating reviews and Google reviews specifically, what it's doing is it's streamlining your marketing budget. It's fortifying it. It's not making you spend as much on strategies to see a lower return on your investment. As a matter of fact, this is just a year one to year two case study that we took for one of our practice owners. And just studying the metric of increasing better review volume and review consistency. Over one year, this particular practice increased their website's traffic by 40%, <coughs> increased their, <coughs> pardon me, their search presence within Google by a factor of over 100% between Google search as well as Google Maps. That ultimately then led to an increase of leads by 38%. So quality is how we perceive what strangers are saying about us online. Yes, we might trust that referral, that recommendation that our friend had given us, but we then fortify that and we validate that by what other people that are online that we don't know about are saying about your practice, which is why this is so critical. Again, reviews, local listings really help with the authoritativeness of what Google is looking for within the e algorithm. Social media. We have to stop seeing social media as just a place to connect with family and friends. Facebook, Instagram, these are inherently search engines, albeit they're different types of search engines, but these are also places that your patients are going to look you up. As a matter of fact, Facebook averages 1.5 billion with a B searches for businesses daily. Okay. So, what are you doing about social media? Are you keeping profiles with, uh, you know, having just social media profiles with Facebook, Instagram, TikTok? What they're doing is they're establishing more what we call link credibility, okay? It's showing search engines that, yes, you're now, you're visible within these other platforms, which these platforms happen to be very authoritative because they're also very heavily trafficked websites. Patients are also having discussions about people about the businesses that can um, that they that they find credibility within, which again, getting that content out there is a means of helping to increase your authoritativeness. Social media contributes signals to the authoritativeness when we talk about the eat, uh, what, what Google is looking for with this eat metricing, and again, creating content that people want to share. Um, let's get into more of the meat and the bones here with what we refer to as now again content strategies and SEO. So we've talked about. Uh, the trustworthiness factor and how that applies to the website. We've talked about the authoritativeness with your local listings, your review building, your social media efforts. Now let's really kind of focus on this, again, content strategy, content, content, content. Touch, touched about this a little bit earlier within the webinar today. I'm gonna do a little bit more of a deeper dive in terms of actually showing you what some very credible websites look like from a content perspective. As I mentioned to you earlier, the two failure points that oftentimes will happen within a digital marketing strategy is number one, when you're misaligning your process, where you do it, you're putting the cart before the horse, you're doing things which are tactically too aggressive but without having the right foundation. But secondly, it's about not having a good partner that's helping you to navigate, to tell you some ideas or give you suggestions or really be that guide. Um, that's a very, very critical part. And your digital marketing always needs to be looked at as, as an integrated effort between you and the agency that you're working with, okay? Once you develop, say, great content, guys, you'd be amazed at how many times I see a doctor that might have like a really good video, a presentation that they've done, and they just put it on their website and that's it. They don't think about, oh gosh, how can I maybe slice and dice this video to put this on my social media feeds? Can I create some YouTube shorts and put that onto YouTube 
and then embed that video onto my website or put that video onto say some newsletter marketing that I might be doing. Being able to feed your website additional information and additional content, that's what your blog is all about. If your website doesn't have a blog and most importantly, if you're not feeding that blog, I'll give you an important reason as to why you blog. B-L-O-G, better listings on Google. When you want to promote more traffic to the site, more visibility for your site, it's not just about having good core pages of information and calling it a day. It's oftentimes how you're feeding this website additive information. So if you're engaged with an SEO strategy, and I know how busy orthopedic practices can be, you need to be working with a marketing partner that's going to write that blog content for you. Because again, even though patients don't necessarily read as many blog articles, we, we found that through the data that we showed in the previous slides a few moments ago. They're very, very, very critical for how you're being optimized more within search engine optimization and Google rankings. Having con proper content structuring as well, too. Again, this is stuff that we've been preaching you know, years before this helpful content update has happened within Google, but covering a topic very, very holistically. Again, going back to questions and answers, questions and answers. I'll even prove this here to you guys, is that if I happen to do a search here for knee surgery, Philadelphia, because again, I live right outside of Philadelphia, or knee surgeon Philadelphia, the, the writing really could not be more clear and on the wall, because when we do a Google search like this, what you can also find here is that Google is also telling me, how do people talk or research the topic of knee surgery in the Philadelphia area? So they'll say, people also ask, what is a knee specialist called? Who is the most cited orthopedic surgeon? What is the difference between an orthopedic surgeon and an orthopedic with an AE surgeon? Who's the surgeon for the orthopedic surgeon for the Philadelphia Eagles? This is basically Google telling you this is the content structure that it prefers to see. So again, going back to your website's content, is it written and constructed in a proper question and answer based format? And since we're here, I'm going to actually share with you some examples of really what we look at when we look at a website that is built well for SEO. Let's talk about the trustworthiness factor when we look at this particular website here. Very great trustworthy site. I can click up here on the domain name and it tells me right over here that this connection is secure. So we know that right away we're, we're qualifying a building out a website that Google is going to see as being very trustworthy. <laughs> we talked about the responsiveness of a website as well too. Does your website adapt itself to various uh, screens or device sizes? So in today's age, you really need to build a website that's what we call device agnostic. It doesn't matter if I'm on a widescreen desktop monitor as I'm sharing with you right over here, or as I consolidate my browser's window in here. Sorry, let me just uh, X this out here for a second. We can see that the whole design and the infrastructure is adapting itself to the screen size. Now you can see a bit of a different orientation with this website. As I further consolidate it down, now I'm seeing some additional features, things like, oh, click to call. I can just click on a phone icon. I'm connected directly to the practice's main line. Again, going back to what, our, what did our data say? One of the things that patients value the most is how easy it is it for us to just have that call to action. You know, so for example, when we go onto a website, one of the most annoying things that really annoys patients is that they go onto a website and they can't find a, a simple phone number. So we solve that issue when we build out a website because we'll basically show you, hey, it doesn't matter where you scroll on the site, you're always going to find that phone number that's always gonna stay on the island. It doesn't matter where you actually go. And by the way, guys, if, if any of you were the moments, the, the time that we have left that's remaining, if anyone would like a quick little website diagnosis or tell me how I can get some better conversions from my website, feel free to put your website in the Q&A right now. Rachel will tell me who those practices are and we can actually do like a live breakdown for the moments that we have that are remaining here. But again, making sure that those calls to actions are always well prevalent. Um, does the website adjust itself to various screen sizes? Um, is there mobile optimization? And can we find what the information that we might even need to on a mobile device as well here too? ADA compliance is also a really, really big one that influences the trustworthy factor. Um, you might not know what ADA compliance is as it relates to a website, but there is a law that's through the affordable, a, a mandate rather, that's through the Affordable Care Act that states if you're any type of healthcare business, your site also needs to cater to people that have disabilities. So for example, can I just say click on a button here and gosh, if this site was way too bright for my eyes, 
I can say darken the contrast if I needed to do that, or I can say increase the text size if I needed to do that. This meets an ADA standard. Now, for those who are watching and your site is not ADA compliant, I'm not trying to scare you when I say this, but you are exposing your practice to litigation. We've been talking about ADA compliancy now for several years. Only recently though, has this really become much more of a thing of practices being served lawsuits by an anonymous quote unquote patient that went onto your website, filed the complaint, and therefore they hired an attorney to represent themselves. There are attorneys which are looking for very easy wins to litigate against for practice owners that are not in ADA compliancy. So, you know, think about ADA compliancy as having um, website insurance or a website seatbelt. You just got to have it. Uh, by not, you know, you can be facing lawsuits that you can settle, uh, being faced lawsuits that practices have, being, have had to settle in court for five figures just because of something that was very, very avoidable had it been constructed the right way. Now, when we talk about the content strategy on, on these websites as well, too, let's go to doc, this particular website here as we take a look here at total hip replacement. First, I want to point out here something, everybody, and look at the holistic nature of this particular content structure, okay? This particular doctor really only has a hip focus and a little bit of knee as well, too. That's really all that they're doing. So if that's all that you're doing, then that's really all that we need to be focusing on. If you're a general orthopedic practice, you need to have general orthopedic content on your as well, too. But even when we go into this, say, some of these sub pages here with hip pain treatment and diagnosis, you can go to hip arthritis or you can go to childhood hip disorders as well, too. So you can see right off the bat, this particular practitioner is very much covering topics in a very holistic way. And each and every one of these topics has its own dedicated page to it. Okay, now if I go to the page here on total hip replacement, for example, again, we can see such a great structuring of content format, that question and answer based content format. What is total hip replacement? Why is total hip replacement surgery performed? Why do we need it? In this particular case, then the doctor had a great, um, it looked like a Zoom presentation, and he talked about this particular part of his practice and he created a YouTube video and we embedded that onto the website. This is all a great part of really of your SEO. How do I decide when I need a hip replacement surgery? Again, these are all common questions that if you're doing hips at your practice right now, that I guarantee you're probably being asked by your patients. You have to be answering those questions onto your website. And again, talking about these subjects in a very, very, very holistic way. When we look at the doctor's credentialing here, Look at all this credentialing here. I mean, really talking about his biography, you know, his expertise in being a direct interior, in direct interior total hip replacement robot and computer assisted hip replacement. Guys, this is just talking about how great this doctor is. We can show his authority here by having a great YouTube video of him talking about his practice as well, too. His academic background here, his training his license and certifications, the professional societies that he's a part of. This is all part of that expertise as well too. So this is the model of a very well-positioned website to drive search and visibility and credibility in light of a lot of these changes that Google is making with its helpful content update. So hopefully this guy, this gives you a bit of a, bit of a framework, if you will, of understanding, you know, number one, why you have to have proper content structuring, but secondly, and additively, why you really need a partner that's going to help you to navigate this. Last is paid search here, okay? We call it PPC, pay-per-click advertising. It's also known as search engine marketing as well too. And this is a great way of being able to drive guaranteed and immediate exposure for your practice, <laughs> especially when you're looking to convert particular surgeries or types of patients into your door. 53% of all website traffic actually comes from organic search, but only 15% of it comes from paid search, okay? But PPC quickly improves your online visibility and customer leads. But just understand that with paid ads, it's prohibitively expensive. I mean, it definitely is something that you need a much more robust budget to be able to do, okay? And you should look at it not necessarily as a longer-term strategy, but converting very specific types of patients into your door. So for example, if you're, uh, a specialist that really specializes in robotic surgery, for example, it might not be a bad idea to run an ad campaign around that particular topic because that is what you're trying to do. That's what you want to attract more of. 
Um, running an ad campaign, say, around just general orthopedic surgery or orthopedic, orthopedic surgeon, well, that can mean anything, right? What is the type of patient that you might be looking to attract? And so generally speaking, the, the less specified or less spe specialized your ad campaign is, um, the less it's going to convert, okay? But again, you don't want to do it alone. Don't run your ad campaign alone because oftentimes people will say, well, I can just do this. I can just pay Google directly myself and I can manage it. You, it's a great way of being able to exhaust your budget very, very quickly with seeing a very poor return on your investment. Additively though, as well too, because when your ad campaign is really is, is going, it's, it's really something that needs to be managed on the daily basis, okay? It's all about helping to maximize your exposure by also limiting the amount of investment or cost that you're putting into it. And also too, the reason why we put this at the top of our pyramid, the top of our framework is because in order for your ad campaign to work well, it, it requires a great foundation as well too. It's the most aggressive thing that you can be doing, but without the right foundation, it's no different than again, that very overweight, diabetic, uh, doesn't exercise patient that expects you to be a miracle worker just by replacing their knees, okay? So again, as we look at this in the pyramid, what we call our pyramid of success, this aligns very, very, very well with these new changes that Google has been doing. But as I mentioned before earlier, this is something that we've been ahead of the curve now for years, okay? It's just now becoming much more important in terms of the quality of websites and how websites are really going to be promoted. So you can see that with all these factors of EAT, how they very much align with all the parts and the pieces of our pyramid here. Everything from the experience, the expertise, to the authoritativeness, to the trustworthiness. This is why having a partner in this space that is tried and tested and has that 10,000 hour principle is very, very, very critical to position you for success. And it's not just me saying that, this is actually feedback that we're actually given from our clients as well too. As a matter of fact, we actually had produced a 2023 survey, end of year survey. We just got this data back last year, this past January, where from over 1,000 survey respondents, 93% of our survey respondents had indicated that they rate their experience with us as a five. And why is that? Because we're not here to be a vendor, we're here to be a partner in your growth. And there's a very, very, very big difference between that two. And to further, further validate that, I would encourage anyone that's watching this to Google my advice, Lehigh, Utah, which is where our current corporate offices are based out of. We practice what we preach as well too. We're a 4.8 rated entity with over 476 Google reviews and we're generating them all the time, okay? This is a lot of social proof and trust that will help you to give you guys the assurances that we are here to take care of you. We're not here to sell you, but we're here to become an invested um, contributor. I would encourage you to, again, please take out your phone, uh, scan this little QR code here on the left to book your complimentary consultation. Um, would love to be able to meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. If you're not quite ready for a consultation, but maybe you might wanna keep in touch, please, I would encourage you, Scan the code to the right here. Uh, this is my personal, uh, my advice, Instagram. I encourage you to follow me here um, on an ongoing basis. We'll happy to help you to navigate a lot of these changes and headwinds that we're seeing in the Google sphere to obviously put you into a winning position as we progress through the rest of this year. So thank you guys so much for your time. Um, Rachel, I don't know if we have any um, uh, website volunteers. I know we just have about a minute here left, but if there's any questions, I'm happy to field any questions from the audience here that um, we, can, we can end with. Um, I think you did such a thorough job and because we are just about here at time, no questions that have come in right now, but if you have questions, you can again, book with Michael. Um, I'm going to be sending out an email. If for some reason you miss the codes or all of those things, I'll include all of that in our email. Um, and just thank you everyone so much for your time and you'll be hearing from us soon with all the recordings. All right. Very good. Thank you all so much. Uh, hope you guys make it a great day. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you.